south of us had some rough weather, but it's my prayer that there was no loss of life and there continues to be no loss of life. I know things like that that happen cause a lot of damage, turmoil. But God is good all the time, all the time. God is good. Once a month, we've been dealing with one of the churches of Asia, going through the letters from chapters 2 and 3 of Revelation. And this week we are on the church of Pergamum. Pergamum. Revelation chapter 2, beginning in verse 12. If you want to open your Bibles, that's where we'll be for the majority of our text. There are seven churches of Asia, and they're pictured for you on your screen, the names of them at the very least. We dealt with Ephesus and Smyrna, and now we're on to the church of Pergamus. And there will be others to deal with in the coming months. We read in our scripture reading, James chapter 4 and verse 4, it talks about the idea if we set ourselves as wanting to be with the world, we find ourselves enemies with God. And that's the principle that Jesus gave in the Sermon on the Mount when he said that you cannot serve two masters, either you'll serve the one and hate the other, you can't serve God and the world or mammon. And that's a principle that we need to learn and to, or to, to continue to learn and to imply uh, into our lives because so many people are caught up with worldliness and sometimes it's evident within the church as a whole. Not here, but, but you see it in examples of those that have fallen away from being the true church. They've crept in, the world worldliness creeps into the life of people and they get caught up with the things of the world and it leads off into error. We know in 1 John also, it talks about worldliness, that the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life. You remember when Adam and, uh, when Eve sinned and Adam, Adam sinned, you have all three of those taking place there at the garden. When Eve saw that that tree was good for food, or that fruit was good for food, lust of the eyes, she wanted, she was, she, she wanted to partake of that food, lust of the flesh, and then the boastful pride of life, thinking it would make one wise. First John chapter 2, verses 15 and 17 says, Do not love the world, nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away and also its lusts. But the one who does the will of God abides forever. We talked about this morning in our Bible class about the idea of being holy, the idea of being separate from the world. We're different. We're supposed to be set apart, sanctified, as Jesus prayed in his high priestly prayer in John 17, 17. Sanctify them to your truth. Your word is truth. And so we are to be separate and different than the world. It's a problem if we're looking like the world and behaving like the world and loving the things the world loves. But it's a difference when we stand up for that which is holy and is good. And sometimes we face persecution for that. And don't be ashamed if you do. Because God is for you. And always remember, if, uh, if God is for us, who can be against us? And the answer is no one. Not even Satan can be against us if we're with God. So let's talk about the church in Pergamum. Revelation chapter 2 verse 12 it says, And to the angel of the church... In Pergamum, right? This is what the one who has the sharp two-edged sword says. So you have the author of this letter being the angel, or the Lord himself, being the main author. We know that Jesus, or the Hebrews writer rather, in Hebrews 4, 12, and 13, talks about the Word of God being sharp, a double-edged sword, two-edged sword. Matter of fact, the text says it's sharper than any two-edged sword. Why is it? Uh, why? What makes the sword sharp? It, it would be. It would be foolish if a, a person, especially during an era where they use swords as as the main weapon, if, if that soldier goes in to fight with a dull blade, it would be foolish for that soldier to do so. And so the so that soldier would make sure that sword is sharp. He doesn't want to be caught without a sharp sword because it might cost him his life in defending in defending himself. And unless the Lord of God is pictured as a sharp sword. 
Now, it's not, the text does not say we use it as a weapon to, say, to, go, to go get them or to, to, to browbeat or to police people. But it's the Word of God that cuts to the heart. The Word of God, whenever you hear the Word of God and, and you analyze it with your life and you believe what it says and you apply it to your own life, it cuts you to the heart. It convicts you. For example, in Acts chapter 2, it convicted the people on Pentecost. They were cut to the heart and they said, Men and brethren, what shall we do? What cut them to the heart? The preaching of the Word. The, God's Word cuts to the heart. It's able to pierce both joints and marrow. And it discerns the division of the soul and the spirit. You think about, you think about that sharp sword. It doesn't cut as if we say like a, like a knife cuts through our skin. It cuts internally because it, it, it cuts our mind. And one can be cut either one of two ways. One can be cut in, in, in response to humility, to obey what, what God says, or as in the case of in, when Stephen was being stoned, they were, cut to, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed on them with their teeth, the text says, because they were in anger. They, the, the word that was preached by Stephen went against what they were living, what they stood for, and they didn't like it. And you have the two different responses from there in Acts chapter 5 and also Acts, or Acts chapter, or chapter 7, excuse me, and Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, you had those that were willing to obey, and in Acts chapter 7, those that were not. But they heard, both, both audiences heard preaching of the word, and you have two different responses. It's similar today, with God's word being a sharp two edged sword. And this, this word is from Christ. Remember John's gospel? In the beginning was the word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now how do we know who this Word is? John 1.14, the Word became flesh, and we beheld His glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, and we know that's Jesus. Jesus is also the Word. He's the, sharp, he's the one that has a sharp two-edged sword. Ephesians 6.17, put on the full armor of God, and, talk, and 10 and following, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Ephesians 6.17, Jesus is here is described as a judge and executioner who uses that sword. And you remember when he talked about the in John 15 and other places where he talked about pruning the, the branches and anyone, anyone that was not found in Christ would be cast off and burned to the fire. Similar to Psalm 1 where it talks about the chaff which the wind drives away, the ungodly like the chaff. And they're casting to, and it talks about casting into the fire. That short sword, Jesus is going to come one day, not as our Savior, but as our judge. I remember I using this illustration Wednesday night, and it bears repeating because it is, it is totally accurate and, it, and, it, and, it, and it's beneficial. The idea of this man that got into an accident as he was outrunning the police, and his car caught on fire, and there's a man that pulled him out of that fire, and he, he didn't suffer many, many injuries and the next day he was before the judge and the man says to the judge, didn't, uh, wait a minute, weren't you the one that pulled me from the fire yesterday? And the judge replied, sir, yesterday I was your savior. Today I'm your judge. That's a picture of time. God is patient. He's our savior now. Those that he, he gives man time now, like the, for example, he gave man during the time of the flood time, 120 years, the preaching of the word. They didn't heed the word, only eight souls and their family, the, the eight souls were saved through the ark. And similar what goes on today, preaching of the word, people have a choice to hear or not hear. And one day he's coming not to be, our, not to be the savior of the world, but then he's coming as a judge. And he's going to judge those that have not obeyed the will of the, the, the gospel. But for those of us that are doing His will, that have obeyed the gospel, it's a glorious day. And we're not facing condemnation, we're facing glory. And that's a wonderful thing. And that's, a neat, that's, that's why we should always be mindful of our purpose, of our goal, and the need to be holy, and the need to be in Christ. So that way we are covered by the blood of Jesus, declared righteous before God, and have no need of, of fear of the day of judgment. Because we are in Christ. Let's, let's think about the city of Pergamum for a moment. Sometimes it helps us in discovering and, and learning about these different cities and the cultures around them. You see what's going on and how it affects the church, church that is there. Pergamum is located 15 miles from Asia, uh, off the uh, 
in the coast of Asia Minor from the, in, from the Aegean Sea. It was the ancient capital of Asia Minor, Asia's greatest city. Pliny called it the most distinguished city in Asia. It is known as the Turkish city today of Bergama. And think about this, beyond all other sites in Asia Minor, it gives the traveler the impression of a royal city, the home of authority. The rocky hill on which it stands is so huge and dominates the broad plain of the, uh, the Caicos, which is a river, so, so proudly and boldly. This was a city that was a capital of Asia, and it would have been a royal city, and it, was, it, was, it would have been a most known city. For example, it might be, you might can compare it to a city like Las Vegas or Washington, D.C., or a city that's well known, or, or perhaps over in England, in Great Britain, where the, where the, where the king or queen is, and that place that, that was known. And of course, you have different things that goes within there. It was, it was a big city. It had a 200,000 volume library, second only to the, to the Alexandrian library. Now, I love books, but I don't have 2,000 volumes of books. That's a lot of books. So, in other words, you see a picture here of how education would have been involved in the city and how people can go and learn and read and, and things of that nature. It was the center of culture and learning. Anybody who wanted to learn anything would go to that city to learn. And so it was almost, it was almost like the center focus of, of travel and, and learning there. It was, center of four main, it was the center of four main deities that were worshipped. Athena, Asclepius, Dionysus, and Zeus. Of course, that's nothing, nothing different in that culture because they worshipped all kinds of false gods in, in that, that culture. And that was going on. That's why Paul would write, uh, avoid idolatry. You have idolatry being warned against in the Old Testament and the New Testament. God even said in one of the first commandments, the first commandment, have no other gods before me. But the world, when it acts like the world, when it has no knowledge of God, it makes its own God, and which that God cannot save. You imagine, you know, for example, I heard, not heard, but I saw one time before, it was a couple years back, when this flood came in this third world country, and the people were literally carrying their idols, their gods, safety from water. That is so backwards from what God is. God saves. We don't save God. Why would I put my trust in something I have to save out of a flood? Or something that's not life? That's for saying, that's, that's like, that's like me saying this microphone right here is my God. What's that microphone going to do for me? Nothing. Nothing. It's like the, it's like the saying, what can, a, what can a dead man do? Nothing but stink. That, that's the only, it, it, it can do nothing for me. Because there's only one God. And that's the God in heaven. The one who has proven himself to be God time in and time out. Time out. And yet man, when man, figures, when man thinks of himself, he says, you know what, I don't like the way God has it. I don't like God's plan. It goes against my life. I'm going to make my own God, and that's why I'm going to follow him. And a lot of people in this world, themselves are God. They make their own self God. I don't, I don't be told what to do. I don't do, I don't do it for me, me alone. It's all about me. <coughs> One day they're going to find out it's not all about me. It never was about me. It was always about God. And I'm always, I'm always obliged to put others first. Not only was it, not only was the center of four main deities that were worshipped during this time in the culture, but also it had the cult of emperor worship. That'd be equivalent to today saying someone worshiping the president of the United States as as, as a god. Could you imagine and to think the way some people treat people like that? It makes you wonder if they actually treat them as a god. But that's what's going on in this culture. You had not only worship of idols, but also those that were living idols, the, the emperors. Man trusting in man does not work. Man trusting in God always works because there's only one God. For example, in, in this cult of uh, emperor worship in Pergamus, in AD 29, you had the temple to Augustus Caesar. 
built. And then later on, you had temples built to Trajan and Severus later. They would build these different temples to honor these different emperors as if they were a god. But every single one of them died. If they were truly God, they would still be living today and, never, and always existed and never died. Why would I put myself and in, in, in my trust in someone who is able to, who, who dies? That is backwards. That is, that is just outrageous. But people, the world does what the world wants to do. And it's sad. It's sad. In the world in which we live, the world does what they want to do. And we pray and we, and we want people to come to the light, come to the truth, and understand who God is and come to know God. Of course, we have the, this, this city of Pergamon and this letter to a worldly church. They were a church that was filled with the world. So you have, but at the beginning, you have the commendation. And a lot of these letters, and almost the case of every one, Jesus, the one that's authoring these letters, always gives a, a, condemnation, a, a commendation. Here's what you're doing right. But then here's what you're doing wrong. God acknowledges things that are right. I understand you're doing right. Here's the thing you're doing right, and here's what you're doing wrong. And that's nothing further than what Jesus did in his ministry. When people would come to him, I mean, for example, the, man, the rich young ruler came to him, what good things must I do to inherit eternal life? And he says, and you got, of course, he gave the answer. And Jesus says, here's, what, here's, what, here's one thing you lack. It's good, it's good you get that. But here's one thing you lack. And so you, you see that through Jesus' life in his ministry, uh, how he even acknowledged, the other, you, here's what you did right, but here's what you need to do to take it a step further. And so you have these different letters that have this, this encouragement of, here's what you're doing right, but this, is, I, have, this I have against you. So in verse 13 he says, I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, and you hold fast my name and did not deny my truth, my, my faith, excuse me, even in the days of Antipas, my witness, my faithful one, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. God knew the dwelling and where the place of idolatry was. He knew where it was a case later on you see in Revelation where it says, I know where Satan's seat is. In other words, I know where evil's taking place in your city. I know where evil is. I know what goes on in your life. I know who you worship. I know who you hold first in your life. God is not unaware of the things that we do. God is not unaware that they stood fast that God held fast to His name and did not deny His faith of the faith. Remember, the uh, throne of Zeus was on the Acropolis. And you have these different idol gods they would worship. And one, and, and one has said with this idea where Satan's throne is, it could be implying where that idol god is, any, any idol, uh, idolatry. That's where Satan is. That's where evil is. Anything that's anti-God is evil. It's sin. One prescription calls for the worshiper to sleep, and this is this is one of the one of their their things in this in this culture. One of their ways they would worship these false gods is for the worshiper to sleep on the temple floor, allowing snakes to crawl over his body, and infuse him with their healing power, or so, or, or so the case may have, uh, as, they, as they would say. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be laying on any floor with snakes crawling all over me. And besides, what healing power is in a snake? Did not Paul wrong, uh, warn people in, in Romans 1 that it's changed the truth of God for a lie and worship the creature rather than the creator? You, that's nothing different than what Egypt did. Did not Egypt worship cats because they thought their God is a cat like God? The God Ra? That's backwards. Why, why does man want to worship something that God made rather than worship the one that made it? And the, re and the reason is, is because they didn't like the truth. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie. They do not like truth. They do not like what is right. They want to do what they see as right, what they want to do, what pleases themselves. 
And that's why Paul writes, God gave them over. If people want, whatever people want to do, God will allow you to do it. But be warned, you will not be free from the consequence of that choice. God allows us to make decisions of whether to follow God or not. But He's going to hold man responsible for the choice that He makes. There are a lot of people that would choose, that would choose stuff. As, as an example of that, worshiping snakes, cats, whatever the case may be, a statue, a tree. There's only one God. There is only one living God. His home is in heaven. Our Savior is not dead. There are many religions today that follow a dead Savior. There's only one that's alive whose body is not on this earth. You want to know why his body is not on this earth? It's because he is alive. Up from the grave, he arose. All the different false, false idols, all the different saviors, prophets that they would say as their prophet are dead, buried somewhere. Muhammad has a grave somewhere. All the different prophets, they, 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 Joseph Smith, whoever it may be, is dead in the grave, but Jesus Christ is alive. There is only one true God. There is only one prophet, priest, and king. And that's Christ. This letter serves as, as an example for the church not to be caught up with the world. They held fast God's name. Matthew 16, 18, when after Peter had said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus says, Based upon your confession, uh, Blessed are you, Simon and Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father only. And I also say, You are Peter. And upon this rock, Upon this confession, based upon the fact that I am the Son of God, that's what Jesus said, I will build my church, and notice this, the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. In other words, death wouldn't stop him from, from, from building the church, and death will not stop the child of God who holds fast to God's name. We're reminded over and over, Hebrews 3, 6, Hebrews 10, 23, to hold fast, to hold fast to our faith, to, to the name, to Christ. We've got to place our trust in Christ, not in the things of this world or anything in this world, because this world is passing away as well as the lust thereof. But if we abide in, God's, in God, we'll, we'll live forever in paradise. They did not deny the faith, they did not deviate from the core truth. Jude three, Jude three and four talks about these different. It talks about contending for the faith. Beloved, while I was making every effort to write to you about our common salvation, in other words, Jude wants to write this letter and talk about how the salvation that they have in common. But I felt the necessity to write to you, exhorting that you contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all handed down to the saints. Why? Why are they being urged to contend for the faith? Why are they being urged to do that? Verse 4. There's a, and notice the similarity to what Paul told Timothy. Why, was Paul, why did Paul tell Timothy to preach the word? For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. What is he telling the church? And, and what is John telling the uh, What is Jude telling the church? For certain persons have crept in unnoticed, those who were long beforehand marked out for this condemnation, ungodly persons who turn the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only Master and Lord Jesus Christ. Paul warned Timothy that people will not endure sound doctrine. There will come a time when people will not endure sound doctrine. But instead, he for themselves teachers having their own itch lusts, having itching ears, and turning aside the fables, myths, and that happened, evidently that happened in the Jews' time as well. And so we must contend for the faith. Hold fast the faith. Why is it the case sometimes whenever we are put into trial, we're so quick to give up? I'm talking about us as mankind. Why is it sometimes the case that when something is put before us, and oh, if I say the wrong answer, I'm going to lose popularity, I'm going to lose my friend, I'm going to lose my family, whatever it may be, and we cave in. Why is it the case that some do that? It's because, it's because of lack of trust in the Lord and the one who bought us, our Master. We hold fast to truth. Be the example of holding fast to truth, not denying the faith. 
And then in this text also talks about my faith even in the days of Antipas, my witness, my faithful one who was killed among you where Satan dwells. Antipas likely was a leader of the Pergamum church. We don't know that for certain because not much is known about this Antipas. Tradition says that he was roasted to death inside a brass bull during persecution by a Domitian. Certainly it's probable, but we don't know for certain. Remember when our Lord in Matthew 24 and verse 9 warned, warned his disciples that some of them would be put to death for, for Christ's name? Right here's an example. Not only do you have Stephen in Acts chapter 7, but you also have the example of Antipas here in this letter who was martyred, who was killed for God's name. His faithful witness, my faithful one. If you die, if you ever, if you ever have to suffer death for the name of Christ, for for the faith, God does not forget it. God remembers. God sees that as victory. Remember, if God is for us, who could be against us? It doesn't matter if we die because of our faith. Because as Paul, we should be saying the same thing Paul said, for me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. Paul died for his faith. Paul died for the faith. We are called to deny ourselves and take up our cross. The cross is not just a necklace someone wears on, 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 around their neck. The cross is a death symbol. It means that our life is totally dedicated to God. It's totally dedicated to Christ. And I am ready to die at the drop of a hat for my Lord. Now I pray that we continue to live in freedom and we can, and we can, and we can proclaim God's word throughout the world. But may we always be ready to tell people the hope that we have within us with meekness and fear. And let us live for Christ. Let us not deny His name. Now you have the charge in verses 14 and 15. But I have a few things against you. Here's what you're doing right. You're, you're holding fast in my name. You didn't deny me. But I have a few things against you. That you have there some who hold the teaching of Balaam, who kept teaching Balak to put a stunning block before the sons of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality. So you also have some, in the same way, held the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Some held the teaching of Balaam, that's the idea of idolatry. Tolerating error is never acceptable in the church, 2 John 9-11. through If anyone comes to among us and, and, and preaches anything, any, any other doctrine, does not teach the doctrine, we are not even bidden God's Godspeed. We are to keep away from that. Ephesians 5-11, uh, it says... Do not be partakers of the fruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. We don't partake in evil. We don't tolerate false teaching. We stand up with, with, against it with what? The truth. And we do so in love. Error is to be rebuked. Titus 3, 10 and 11, it's to be rebuked. And yet some in the world today love to boast in error. You remember the church at Corinth also, as we're going to Titus? One of its problems was it was boasting that they were tolerant of sin. 1 Corinthians 5, they had a man that was living with his, father, with his father's wife, and they were boasting that they were tolerant. Look, we're, we're a tolerant church. We're, we're tolerant of sin. That makes us better. Paul says, no. You're to put that man among you. Why? Because the church is to be holy. Because God is holy. Because the church stands for truth. It stands for things that are right. It doesn't stand for evil. Paul t uh, told Titus, Titus 3, 10 11, to, re to reject the fascist man after first and second warning, knowing that such a man is perverted and is sinning, being self condemned. Evil is to be rejected, false teaching is to be rejected. These that were teaching the doctrine of Balaam in in the church should have been put out and should have been dealt with, but they were tolerant, tolerant of, their, of, of their doctrine. I'm all for being patient, and I'm all for helping people and, and being like Apollos. Uh, and and that's, a, that's a biblical way of doing it. Matthew 18, 15 through 18. 
talk about if someone sins, we should go to that person, to him and him alone. And if that person doesn't hear us, take two or more with us as witnesses. And if they don't hear the witnesses, then take it to the church. And that's how the problems dealt with. Thus, for example, I remember Aquila and Priscilla who took Apollos aside, who was teaching error, and taught him a better way. And he, and, and he, he, and we, and we know he would probably went back to talk truth. But you have that example. That those things can be handled that way. But when it comes to a point of a church like this, that is instead of dealing with it, oh, we're just going to be tolerant and let them teach what they want to teach. That's not true. That's not that's not what the church should do. And this church is being condemned by God. For doing that, I have this against you. That is not right. The church is to be pure, whole, holy, without spot and blemish. Ephesians 5, that's why Christ purchased the church, that he might present us without spot and without blemish. The church stands for truth. There is too much false teaching, too much error in our world today. And our world is confused because people want to change the truth for a lie. Because there's something in the Word of God that, don't, that they don't agree with, and so they decide to change it. The Bible says that God's Word is forever settled in heaven. It is unchangeable. You can't change God's Word and stand right with God. We are to stand on truth. The truth is what sets us free, John 8, 31 and 32. Pergamum held to the teaching of Balaam involving the eating of meat sacrificed to idols and sexual immorality after Balaam uttered his oracles of blessing instead of cursing in Israel. Remember that from Numbers 22 and 224. The blessing of the Israelites engaged in immorality with the Moabite women and ate their sacrifice and worshipped their gods. In Numbers 31 16, it stated that the Moabite women acted by the counsel of Balaam. And so like the Israelites who were seduced by Balaam's false teaching, some in the church of Pergamum were led to mix with pagan, the pagan system of idolatry. And that's found in Jude 10 and 11. So in other words, it, what, the reason why that you have Balaam here is to give an example of what m- might have been going on in Pergamum because you have these different idol gods that this would be taking place and now it's been tolerated in the church. And it shouldn't be. It shouldn't be. Remember, we are not to be like the world. We are to be like Christ. Holy, different from the world. When the church starts acting like the world and living like the world and doing like the world, it's no longer the church. There are too many social clubs that are using the name of Christ in order to gain popularity and monetary gain. That's not holy. There are people that it's, it's, it's a shame that people would wear the name of Christ and teach error, knowing it's error, to receive that which is unholy. And why, is it, why does it happen? Romans 1. They would rather worship themselves and their pleasures rather than holding on to the truth. Because it's the truth that sets us free. It may not be popular with the world. It wasn't popular with Jesus. Jesus was put to death for the truth. Why should we expect any less? And why should anybody expect to receive what Christ did even receive from the world? That is so far from the character of Christ. Christ was humble. Not once did he ask for money. Not once did he say, Well, I'll heal you, heal you if you give me X amount of dollars. Well, I, I might do this if... if you might be saved if you have enough whatever, whatever it is. You can, the more you watch people and the way they teach you, the way they do, you can tell by their character who they serve. We are to serve Christ. We are to be truthful. And we are to exalt in the truth. We are to have no friendship with the world, James 4 4. Because when you make yourself a friend, a friend of the world like some that was in Pergamum, you become an enemy of God. You're not God's friend. And God is not for you. God is against you. And if God is against you, there's, no, there's, no, there's nothing that's, that's, that's a greater fear than knowing that God is against you. Some was holding not only the teaching of Balaam, but also those, some who was tolerating the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Just like the church, of, uh, the, the, different from the church of Ephesus, 
who did not tolerate the, the doctrine of Nicolaitans. They actually dealt with the false teaching. And so God commended the church of Ephesus that they did not tolerate the false teaching. Here we have one, instead of, instead of doing what Ephesus did, they're being tolerant. And instead of dealing with it, just like those that were teaching the doctrine of Balaam, they were tolerant of their doctrine as well. About running out of time this morning, but you have the, the example in 2 Corinthians 6, verses 14 and the following. We are to have no partnership. No partnership. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. We are to have no partnership with the world. We are not to endorse the worldly things of the world, that which is error, that which is sin. And if we have to stand alone, then let us stand alone. Because we have Christ standing right beside us saying, that's my servant. You put a hand on my servant, you're putting a hand on me, and if you put a hand on me, I will judge you. For example, you remember when the apostle uh, Saul of Tarsus, before he became the apostle Paul, he's persecuting the way, and, and of course he comes on the road to Damascus and he says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Now, was Saul literally persecuting Jesus Christ as he's going throughout the, trying to get rid of the way? No, he's, he's persecuting the church. What that shows us is that when, when the world touches the child of God, he's touched, it's, it's the equivalent of touching Christ himself. And it will be Christ on the day of judgment that will vindicate the child of God. That will show, that will show those that are in error. You touched my child. You touched me, and now I'm coming for you. But God always, remember, he's still, always still, he offers repentance, or he offers forgiveness if you repent. If they would repent. But if someone dies in a condition in which they, which they hurt the church, hurt the world, hurt the truth, judgment awaits. Judgment awaits. We are not to cause a stumbling block. Of course, you can go to Romans 14 that talks about different scruples. And then we end with this, verses 16 and 17, the, the command and admonition. Rather than being like the world, tolerating evil and sin and, and, and false teaching, repent. Repent. God is still, yet they were, even though they were in sin, God is still extending an opportunity of repentance. Repent. But if not, the one who has a sharp two-edged sword, verse 12, I am coming to you quickly and I will make war against them with the sword of my mouth. Matthew 7, 21-23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does will of my Father in heaven will enter. But many will say to me that day, Have you not prophesied in thy name, cast out many demons in thy name, and done many wonderful works in thy name? Then I will say to you, Depart from me. I do not know you, you workers of iniquity. The sword of his mouth. Those words will cut deeper anything ever before. To have the very Son of God who died for you say to you, I do not know you. Maybe a lot of people in this are going to try to make an excuse for I, I imagine. But, 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 Lord, I, I don't know you. You claim to do this stuff in my name, but that's not my will. That's not the will of the Father. You did your own will in my name. But for the child of God who does the will of the Father, enter in to the joy of the Father. That's worth any popularity. That's worth any money. And that's, and, and that's worth keeping our souls in check. Because I can, I can guarantee you nothing in this world is worth losing our souls over. Nothing. Not a thing. Nothing in the world. Because our inheritance that God has given us to those that obey Him is invaluable and it can't be taken, it, 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 
should be hailed as that as that valuable in our life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, to him I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone and a few name and a new name written on the stone, which no one knows but he who receives it. I don't know what that's going to, what that's like. All I know is it's going to be glorious. We can overcome. God never tells us something we can't do. We can overcome. I don't like it's hard. Sometimes it's, it's hard. To, we, get, we get caught up in the world. It happens. The disciples did. But we grow. And we learn. And we mature. And we practice. And we, and we, we, we try to do the best that we can to be God's people. We should be concerned about truth and not fall to the, to the trap of, of falling the world. This world is not our home. This world is not our home. Brethren, we are to be homesick. Heaven is our home. And we should long for it. We should be living as if we've just left town for a while and we've been gone for a while and we're ready to come home. That's how heaven should be viewed. That's 2 Peter 3, 7 3, where it talks about longing for and hastening the coming of the day of the Lord. Homesick. It may be the case if you're not homesick this morning, something may need to change. And I'm talking not, I'm not talking about being homesick for a parent or whatever it may be. I'm talking about homesick for heaven. May our priorities be always for heaven and not upon this world. We're moth and rust corrupts and these break through and steel. Let us lay ourselves lay our treasures in heaven. And let us let us let our heart follow after. You may need to run the response invitation. If you do, please come now as we stand and as we sing.